Hey guys, this is GKCS. We are talking about central decomposition, which is uh, actually a long awaited topic and far more interesting than I thought it would be. Uh, central decomposition is taking a tree, which is a graph which doesn't have any cycles, right, and then breaking it into parts, just like in a segment tree or most other trees that you talk about. You break them into parts such that each of the parents contains some sort of aggregate information. Okay, and uh, Using this, you can solve queries and you can also handle updates. So that's one of the most common scenarios in computer programming. We'll be running through two problems today, uh, which use central decomposition, and let's see whether we can uh, solve them. So to start off, we have a tree given to us. This tree has no cycles to it, so therefore it's a tree. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to find the centroid of this tree. So the centroid of the tree is defined as that node, such that the number of nodes from from each branch b for all branches so i equal to 0 to for all branches from that node uh, the number of nodes from that branch has to be less than n by 2 where n is the total number of nodes in the graph okay so if i pick up let's say this node um, this node has 1 2 3 4 in this branch so just marking that, that will come out to be four nodes from this branch, one node from this branch, one node from this branch, one, two, three, four, five nodes from this branch, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen nodes from this branch. And the total of that comes out to be nineteen, twenty-five. Twenty-five. So there are twenty-five nodes in this. Uh, in fact, this. Yeah, so we have excluded this. So there are 26 nodes in this graph because 25 plus the node itself. So that is coming out to be 26 nodes. n by 2 will give you 13. Now, the number of nodes from any branch has to be less than 13. So it is at most 12. Okay, at most, less than 13. This edge has 14 nodes to it and therefore this cannot be the centroid of the tree. So this is not a central tree. Now, one of the things that you can do is you can try this for every node. But the smart way to do this is to choose one arbitrary node as a centroid. As you're going to assume it as the centroid, and then after doing a DFS or a DFS, what's going to happen is you know the frequency, the, the count of nodes from each branch. Okay, and then what you can do is you can move towards the heaviest branch. The reason this works is because what you're looking for is all branches to have less than n by two. If there is a branch having greater than n by 2 nodes, if you move towards it, uh, the tree can only get more and more balanced. Right? So logically what you're going to do is you're going to move towards the heaviest branch, let's say this one. And over here, we're going to do the same calculation again. So the number of nodes uh, in this branch is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's 12. And therefore, logically, what should happen is uh, 25, 13 are in the remaining, that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, so it is 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, yeah, yeah, and unlike, unlike me, the computer can actually do this in far more efficiently, you know, it doesn't need to count the number of nodes every time it goes to a new node, what you can do is you can, you can see 14 nodes are on this side and the 25 minus 14 is uh, basically 11 nodes. So you already had 11 nodes on this side, you're going to add one, which is this node, which is then going to be 12 nodes, basically 11 plus 1, that is 12 nodes. So you can just put a 12 here and uh, because you have done your BFS earlier or DFS earlier, you already have the count of all the nodes in each of these branches earlier. So this entire DFS or DFS is going to take your order in time. And you have found the centroid of this tree. Okay, this is pretty important because finding the centroid of the tree is something that we'll do again and again and again till the whole tree is decomposed. Okay, fine. So this is actually the centroid of the tree and it's guaranteed to be unique also. Uh, the reason being that if you go to any branch now, it's only going to make the tree heavier on one side and lighter on the other sides. Okay, so. The center of the tree is right here, 
index number nine. Let's just mark that in red. Okay. Now what we are going to do is we are actually going to remove this node from the tree. And we are going to go to each of the subtrees and find their corresponding centroids. So drawing the centroid tree, what's going to happen is I'm going to take nine over here as the root of the centroid tree. Okay. Now let's get rid of the other guys. In fact, let's just get rid of nine because that's what you're supposed to do. Cool. Attacking the thing which is the easiest is something which is very useful in computer programming. Therefore, I'm going to attack something which I already know. Five nodes here, four nodes here, one, one. Uh, the total turns out to be five, nine, 10, 11. 11 and then plus one, which is 12. So 12 nodes in total, anything less than, less than so 12 nodes in total, 12 by two gives you six. You cannot have six nodes. So five is the maximum you can have. All, all the branches have less than uh, six in this. And therefore this is the centroid of the next tree. So just marking that again in blue. What's going to happen is that this will become a child of nine here. Doing that index number 20 becomes a child. And it's modeled now to give you new trees. Okay, so the interesting thing here is that 18 and 19 are singular entities. They don't have any children and therefore they have their own centroids. And therefore what's going to happen is 20 is going to have 18 and 19 as children. And we can actually get rid of them immediately to give us this graph. So we can attack any one of these. What we're going to do is we're going to attack this one. Uh, 23 has one node here and two nodes here. In total it has four. Four by two is two. Two nodes on this side. This is not the centroid. Move towards the heavier side, come over here. What happens here is that, again, you have the same thing of two nodes here and one node here. All right, guys, I made a mistake here. Uh, what happened is, I thought that the number of uh, nodes which have to be on each branch has to be less than n by two, but it can be equal to n by two also. And the, the point when I came to this realization is actually in this, this part where uh, there are two nodes uh, if you have 24 as a centroid and there are two nodes if you have 23 as a centroid also. So if the number of nodes is less than or equal to n by two, that's pretty important, equal to is also okay. All right, so uh, the, the scenarios that we saw earlier that 13 won't be allowed. Luckily, we had a centroid, but 13 is also allowed, all right? Uh, in this case, the centroid, of course, is not unique. This could be the centroid or this could be the centroid. I'll just arbitrarily choose this one, okay? So 23 is, is actually, uh, in fact, 23 is over here in our centroid tree. And it in turn has been destroyed to give us these two subtrees. Now 21 is an independent node, so that's a centroid, definitely. And we have 24 or 25, any one of them can be the centroid of this subtree. What we do is we take 24 arbitrarily, and then 25. So you see the structure of this tree is basically you get into smaller and smaller subtrees, and uh, the, the branch from nine is formed correctly then. So up to 25 is this point. And now after nine came eight. Yeah. No, in fact, after nine, there was 20. And from 20, there's another branch here. So yeah, luckily, I remembered that eight has to come here. Or is it eight, really? I just assume that eight is the centroid. Let's, let's have a look. One, one, two. Total number of nodes in this is one, two, three, four, five. And we have one, one, and two. So uh, five by two is 2.5. Less than 2.5 will do our job. All these nodes are less than 2.5 in, in number of nodes from those branches. And what we have is then eight is a centroid. And uh, after 522, again, we have to arbitrarily choose 
three or four, I'm just going to choose three. You can see that having done it for these two subtrees, but having done it for an entire subtree, you can do the same thing for this subtree and this subtree. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to draw the entire subtree and uh, you can have a look at it right now. So the centroid tree is made and you can see that all of the nodes, uh, the, the first centroid that we had is nine. At the second layer, the, sec uh, the subtrees from nine were having centroids of 22 and 14. And then subsequently you had many centroids. So each of these centroids uh, contains some sort of information about their children. Okay. Uh, just like in other trees, uh, this centroid can hold the information of number of children that it has. Okay. But that can be done by segment trees. So why do we need centroid trees? One interesting property of this tree is that, of course, each of the subtrees from this have less than n by two nodes. Okay. That's one of the things. The other important thing is, if I have a node here, and if I have a node in a different subtree, there is no chance that, let's say 11 and 22, there is no chance that 11 can reach 22 without touching 10, without touching 4, without touching 9. And similarly, there is no chance that 22 can reach 11 without touching 8, without touching 20, and without touching 9. Okay, so if I find you the lowest common ancestor, Let's see, and this is in a separate video. Finding out the lowest common ancestor uh, is in a separate video. If you want to find that out, then you should check that out in the description below. Uh, the lowest common ancestor of 22 and 11 is 9. There is no chance that 22 can reach 11 without touching 9. And because that is the case, there is the, the information for distance from 22 to 9 can be stored in 9 itself. And similarly, distance from 11 to 9 can be stored in 9 itself. Also, actually you can store that, but you don't really want to because it takes a lot of memory. What you can do is you can you can compute from 11 to 9 what the distance is just by running above, running upwards. So the height of this tree is going to be at most log n. Right? We just proved that now. The height of the tree is going to be around log n. Log n operations to find the distance between the LCA and this node. Log n operations to find the distance between this and the LCA. So that is log n plus log n. And the time required to find the LC itself is as explained in the other video, log n itself. So this is order log n. Finding the distance between two nodes just takes order log n time. Okay, so the Q queries, you can answer them in Q log n time. Also, of course, why is the height of the tree log n? Well, that's actually pretty obvious because uh, you have n by two nodes on one side, n by two nodes on the other side. And you can have as many branches as you want, but at most n by two nodes in each branch. So what's going to happen is at least you are dividing the uh, the size of the tree by two. So just like in many, many other algorithms, uh, the tree size will go from n to n by two, the subtree size, I'm saying that, maximum subtree size, to n by four, to n by eight, and so on and so forth, up to n raised to the power, n uh, divided by two raised to the power x, which will be equal to one because that's a minimum subtree size, one node. And so X turns out to be log n. Okay. The only thing remaining to analyze actually is uh, the time required to build the tree. So that is N because initially you are doing a DFS to find the centroid. Then you have what? You have the subtrees given to you, which are at most of size N by two. Uh, and for each of them, you find the centroids. So that itself is again n plus n plus, how many times is this again? Well, you're going to be doing this for uh, as many times as the height of the tree is. So the first time you did it for getting this centroid. The second time you did it for this subtree plus the size of this subtree plus the size of this subtree. So that is order n for this entire level. That was this one. Order n for this entire level then order n for the next level and so on and so forth. So this is log n times. And so order n log n time complexity for constructing the tree. Okay. Now log n time for querying, important stuff, and n log n for constructing the tree. Interesting. Let's try to solve a spot problem for this now. We are back to problem solving now and uh, it's a spot problem which is 
Q3 file and what this has is it has a tree given to you. We will be doing the central decomposition of that tree of course. But uh, it has a tree given to you and there are two kinds of queries that you have to answer. The first one is update. So all nodes in the tree are either white or black. Initially they are all black. Okay. And what you need to do is you need to flip it, flip this uh, node U to either white or black. So flip the color of U. That's the operation. The second operation is for a given node V, you need to find the nearest white node to V. Okay, simple stuff. You need to find the nearest white node to V. Distances in the tree are already given to you. They're arbitrary, but they're given to you. Uh, and you have two types of operations. First one is flip, second one is find the distance. Okay. Now, this is a slightly complicated question. So we are going to break this down to simple products. In fact, uh, the, the link in the description below for the blog that uh, talks about central decomposition is a brilliant blog. It's written by Tarun Khattar. And that's probably, that's actually uh, entirely the reason why this video didn't exist. I just read that and I understood what central decomposition is and it turns out to be really fun. So have a look at that blog. Uh, and this, this video is basically an adaptation of that blog. Okay, so here it is. Uh, flipping the color of U. Instead of this, what I'm going to do is, because initially all the nodes are black, all nodes are black. Initially. What I'm going to change the question to is, you can only change a color of a node to white. So change U to white. In fact, you may not necessarily change U to white. So if you use white, it stays white. If you use not white, well, then you change it to white, of course. Uh, of course, this won't give you the right answer now, but we are just going for a simpler version of the problem. So with this pro new problem statement, what we can say is that we had some update operations initially, because uh, initially if someone says, what is the nearest white node to you while all nodes are black, then you just print out infinity. Some update operations happen because of which, let's say, uh, this node is white, this node is white, and let's say this node is also white. And let's say uh, 9 itself is white. Okay. And the distances from 9 to 20 is 30. From here to here is 1. From here to here is 4. From here to here again is 1. Uh, and from here to here is from 20 to 18 is 5. The reason I'm actually noting down distances is because we'll, we'll be using them. So this is, uh, let's say the distance between these two is 4, uh, this is 1 and 1, okay. Now what we are going to do is we are logically going to be storing some information in each of the nodes of this central decomposed subtree, or central decomposed tree rather. Uh, what seems like logical information? Look, if you are the node, you have some aggregate information with you. You are the parent of a few nodes, that's why you have some aggregate information. Now. When is the time that that aggregate information will come to use? When you are the LCA between two nodes. Okay, like 11 and 22, the LCA was 9. That's the time that 9 should have some aggregate information such that I can tell what is the nearest white node between, let's say, 11. The 2 11, rather. Now, when, when does this happen? 22 is just one example. Any time some node in this entire subtree, okay, this entire subtree has to be considered for 11, 9 will come into the picture because the path has to cross 9, okay. So the lowest common ancestor, if you are the lowest common ancestor in this case, you should have some relevant information. That relevant information is the distance from you to the nearest white node that you have. Okay, so the distance from 9 to the nearest white node that it has is 0 because 9 itself is a white node in our case. If 9 was not white, then we would have to go 30 and then 35 I think would be the right answer. Yeah, 35 would be the right answer if 9 itself was not a white node. 
Okay. So that's exactly what we are doing. We are storing the distance to the nearest white node within your subtree. So you're handling distances within your subtree. And now how are we going to answer queries efficiently? Well, finding the nearest white node to B is actually pretty simple. If I ask you what is the distance between two nodes U and V, you can break it down to the distance between U and LCA of U and V plus the distance between V and LCA of U and V. LCA of U and V can be found in log n time. The distance between this node and the LCA can be found in log n time just by moving up the tree, right? Uh, and so basically you can, you can answer this query. However, we are not looking for a specific V. We are looking for any node, which is the nearest white node, okay? But that's, that's the important thing. Any node which is the nearest white node, that node has to exist in some subtree, right? So if given a node, let's say eight, what are the possibilities? It could be that the nearest white node is within the subtree itself, right? So in that case, the answer is simply dist of eight, which is in our case four plus one, which is five. Yeah, you can find this out. You can pre-compute this using uh, that first search, all right? So distance to the nearest white node for eight is five. What is the other possibility that uh, there's a nearer white node to eight? Everything within its subtree is taken care of. Now you need to go to a different subtree, which means go up to your parent, go up to 20 and check if anything is closer. So this is one of the possibilities. The other possibility is go up to your parent. That's going to cost you one. So distance to your parent plus its nearest white node, five. So disk of 20. And of course, this is going to be a recursive procedure. You're going to go up your parent again and again and again. So this gives you distance of parent is going to be one and plus five is going to give you six. So two of the possibilities that you have is this, five and six. And the final possibility is again go up that parent also, which is going to cost you 30, plus distance between nine and the nearest white node, which is zero. So that is zero, which gives you 30 itself. And so then you take the maximum, or rather you take the minimum of these three values, which gives you five. All right, that's the a, that's a basic logic. Uh, the way to do this, of course, is just climb up the tree, look for their corresponding nearest white node, and keep taking the minimum in your own subtree, in your parent subtree, in your grandparent subtree, up to the point that you reach the root. All right, fine. Uh, you can go through this again if you if you like, although it's, it's pretty heavy. Here. One final example is when we are taking 16 and 11 to be white nodes, uh, and these are the distances: 2, 9, 1, 12, and 0. Uh, and we want to find the distance between 13 and its nearest white node. So in the subtree for 13, there is no white node. So distance for 13 and its nearest white node is infinity for its subtree. You go up the parent, you see that the possibility of going up the parent takes you one point. And now you have basically two possibilities. But 14 is already going to be storing its nearest white node which is going to be 9 plus 2, that is 11, uh, or 12 plus 0, which is 12. So 9 plus 2, 11 is going to be smaller, and that's going to be evaluated to 12. Okay. That's one possibility. Finally, of course, you're going for 9, and uh, 9 gives you 30 plus 5 as, as its nearest white node. So 30 plus 35, plus the cost of going up 9. To the point nine, so I'll just take that as three. So this is three plus thirty-five, which is thirty-eight. So these are the three possibilities that you have to find the, I mean, as as the nearest white node to thirteen, and the answer turns out to be then twelve. And if you if you walk through the calculations, you'll see that one plus nine plus two gives you twelve. Okay, that takes care of the queries. The only thing remaining is updates, which is extremely easy actually because Whenever you convert a node to white, 
all you need to do is you need to propagate that information up to the uh, all the ancestors so you go to your parent and you say now the nearest distance between you and a white node is either the distance you already had so the distance nearest white node to the parent is going to be the minimum of what you already had which is distance of the nearest white node to the parent all your uh, or the distance that I have currently. So that is going to be distance of child plus actual distance between parent and child. Okay. So this is actually, uh, this is just a single O1 computation because it's already given to you, the edge weight. Distance between parent is already computed. So what you're going to be doing is this operation will be jumping at most log n levels to all ancestors. So this is going to be your log n operation. Okay. That's the update. The query again is going to be log n because from here when you want to find out uh, the nearest white node, you check your own subtree, that is auto 1. Then you go to your parent and you check whether uh, its nearest white node plus this distance is lesser and then so on and so forth up to all ancestors so that is again log n. So the time complexity of this query and solution basically is log n per query. Okay. Except that of course there's a there's a caveat here. Uh, we change the question. We change the question to say that no you can't um, make white black again. You can only make black white. This, this is a code for question which says that you can only convert from black to white not the other way around. And the Sporge question actually allows the other way around. So we just have a talk about that. It's extremely easy actually. Uh, the querying is the same, exact same. Everything is the exact same thing. Except that whenever there's an update now, white can become black, right? So let's say white becomes black here. Earlier we were propagating this information to the parents. Now also we do the same thing. But now the problem is that you wanted the minimum distance from a node uh, the, the white node in its subtree. How do you do that? Instead of just storing the minimum distance, you're going to be storing the distances of the nearest white node in all of the subtrees. Okay, so distance for a node i with in subtree j is going to give you the nearest distance to a white node from i inside sub three j. Okay, that's all. And doing this, you know, distance i comma j, you head to branch j and find the nearest white node over there. That's all it's doing. Uh, this of course can be done in the in the very first BFS, or rather DFS. What this will allow you to do is if a node is converted to black, you can propagate that information to the parent. You can say that this, this subtree no longer has a black node, uh, no longer has a white node. So what you can do is uh, you can mark that as infinity initially. And for the for the parent of that parent, it can then mark it appropriately. Right. So now everything is solved because you have this data structure which is telling you if you go to branch J, what is the nearest white node in that branch J? Okay. So uh, if you're updating this node to black, what's going to happen is this distance nearest white node from this branch is going to turn to infinity. We are assuming of course that this is also black. Then this branch is also giving you infinity. And the nearest white node to this branch, this, this node is actually infinity for all of the branches that it has. So the relevant information for you is finding the minimum of distance i comma j for all uh, j equal to 0 to all the branches possible. Okay, this, this quantity is the minimum distance of a white node up to node i. Of course, that makes sense because you have pride all branches. Nearest white node in all branches is going to be the overall nearest white node. All right. So that's all you need to do. Instead of keeping a single uh, value, you need to keep a set. I think C++ has a multi-set. 
in Java, you already have something called a tree map. So for every node, you can keep a tree map and you can keep for this branch, what is the, the distance between uh, me and the nearest white node, right? Taking nine as example, the nearest white node to nine in this branch is infinity because all nodes are black. So distance nine has three values in that tree map. So Java, you can implement this using a tree map key value pair. The key is nine. Uh, the, the key for nine is two because this is branch number two. It's the key, and the value is going to be infinity. And the key here, nearest white node, is going to be what's the nearest white node here? Uh, I think I think this is the nearest white node. Yeah, so that will be twelve plus two, which is fourteen. So key number three has value fourteen, and key number one has value 35. Key number one has value 35. So don't get rid of this, don't take a minimum because tomorrow what can happen is this 14, this node can be converted to black. In fact, it has been, yeah. So in fact, this, this is wrong. Uh, we need to go to this point, which will be 12 plus zero. So this is 15, yeah. Nearest white node now is 15. And you saw how that happened because uh, when I converted this to black, this would have its own set, which earlier had two comma infinity. It turned to infinity comma infinity. It came here. It had its own set, which was 11, infinity, and 12. This turned to infinity, which gave 12 as the answer. Goes up, and then it says 3 plus 12 is your answer 15. All right, that's how you handle queries in this question where flipping is allowed. So that's it for central decomposition. Uh, you might have some doubts on this, so feel free to leave them in the comments below. Uh, I'll take probably another question on central decomposition just to clarify the concept even more in the next week. And this week, there might be some code share questions which you want edit orders for. And I'll just leave a poll in the description below. Don't ask me for hints now because the contest is still going on. And uh, best of luck for that.